Welcome to chapter 11, where we are going to talk about fluids, um, and specifically in chapter 11, we're going to talk about fluid statics, so situations where we have a fluid that is not moving. So our goal in this particular lecture video is to go through the first couple of sections of the book where we introduce some key terms that we use um, and define exactly what a fluid is. So if you remember from science classes in middle school or high school, one thing that is often taught is the states of matter. And there are three common states of matter, gas, liquid, and solid. Now, none of those three words is the word fluid, and it is important for us to make that distinction. And before we move on from this slide, it's worth noting that the same material can exist in these different states of matter. So a collection of molecules uh, that are H2O molecules as a gas is called steam. So when you boil a pot of water, there's steam above that. That's water in gas form. And often the most common place where we see water is in liquid form. So that's why we typically just call that water. Um, but that molecule H2O in liquid form is called water. And then as a solid, if we have solid H2O molecules together, that's what we think of when we think of ice. Ice that we might put in our drinks to cool it down or ice all over the place in Michigan in the wintertime. So if none of these specifically are a fluid, we need to know how that idea of fluids compares to these three common states of matter. When we talk about the word fluid, we refer to materials that can flow and take the shape of the container that they are placed in. The air in the room around you is filling the room. It isn't like going up to a certain limit and then there's like a vacuum above it. It takes the shape of the container. There's not weird pockets of non-air. And the water in the drinking glass that you might have in front of you, it also takes the shape of the um, glass up to whatever level um, it exists at. There's no pockets of non-water in that glass. Which means that when we use the word fluid, we actually get to incorporate liquids and gases. Only solids are thrown out and aren't considered fluids. Now, in this particular lecture video, we are going to introduce the idea of density, which is used for fluids but also for solids, and the idea of pressure, which in most cases we are going to be thinking about pressure that fluids can exert on other things. We will later, in later videos, talk about buoyancy and the buoyant force, which is the key and largest problem type that comes out of chapter 11. Okay, so let's start with density. Density is a topic that you may have learned in a previous class. We use the Greek letter rho. It kind of looks like a P, but it is the Greek letter rho, and we don't want to get that confused. If you need to, you can just write out the word density all the time. But density is mass per volume. So mass on top, little m, and volume on the bottom, big V, so that we don't get it confused with velocity. The units of density are kilograms per cubic meter, because mass is in kilograms, and volume in our standard units would be cubic meters. Meters times meters times meters. Okay. For any um, homework assignment or quiz or assessment, you will be able to look up common material densities. We have them on the slides for you to reference during, the, um, during assignments that you're turning in, and we would give those to you um, for, a, for a quiz or an assessment. So there's a whole bunch of examples here, and we notice a couple of things. Things that we think of as gases, helium, air, they have really low densities. Gas, the air in this room, is really low density. Things that we think of as liquids, water here um, in this list, it has a kind of middle density. And things that we think of as solids, with the exception of ice, the things that we think of as solids have higher density. Iron, aluminum, gold, mercury. Gold is extremely dense. And so if you were holding a little cube of gold and a little cube of aluminum, the gold would feel heavier if the volumes were the same. That's what we mean by mass per volume. Okay, so here's an introductory example that I will show us the answer to on the whiteboard, but I want you to pause the video and try it on your own first. We want to think about the amount of air 
the mass of the air in a typical lecture room. So if we think about a classroom that we've been in on campus, uh, we're thinking about eight meters side to side, seven meters front to back, and two and a half meters tall. Just use those simple numbers and try to think about how you would go about figuring out the mass by using those numbers to get the volume and by looking up in this list on the left to get the density. So try that on your own and pause the video. Okay, hopefully you paused it and have tried it. But this is what that would look like. So we have the um, shape here is just a kind of simple rectangular prism. The volume is length times width times height. So the volume is 140 cubic meters. The density, if we looked at that whole entire list, there was dry air at room temperature. The classrooms aren't that cold, so we probably picked that one, 1.21 kilograms per cubic meter is the density. And then the equation that we had on the previous slide, the equation that we had was density is equal to mass over volume. So if we multiply both sides by volume, we get density times volume equals mass. And that's what I plugged in down here below, that we have density 1.21 times the volume 140 is equal to the mass. And so we got, when we rounded, 170 kilograms. Okay. Not too difficult an example, um, and if you kind of felt like you struggled with it, make a note to come back and try this one again um, after a couple more videos in this chapter, because if we're struggling with density, we're going to have a lot of trouble with the buoyant force problems eventually, and so we want to make sure that we have this kind of solid foundation at the start of the chapter. Okay. Right away, we're going to try another one of these. This one is a little bit tougher because we're thinking about a spherical shape. We do not have to memorize how to determine the volume of a sphere. That is something we can look up in a textbook if we need it for a homework and would be provided to us on the um, equation sheets for a quiz or a test. An iron ball has a diameter of four inches. We want to use that information to figure out its volume. We look up iron density on the list here and then calculate what the mass is going to be. So again, try to do this one on your own. Pause the video if you're able to, to work it out so that you can compare your answer with what I have and don't just watch the answer. That's a much better check to see if things are making sense to you. So try the video or try to, the example. Pause the video. Okay. So I've only started this one. We'll continue it uh, as a group. So first of all, the um, volume of a sphere, we first need to get the radius. We were given the diameter, 4 inches, which means the radius is 2 inches, and we need to convert the units. So in meters, the radius is 0 0.0508 meters, tiny little radius. And the volume is 4 thirds times pi times r cubed. That would be something we could look up in our textbook or be given on a quiz. When we plug in that radius, we will get a volume of 0 0.000549 cubic meters. And in this list, the density of iron is given to us as 7,860. So we go back to our nice equation, the new one, right? Density is mass over volume. If we multiply both sides by volume, then we get density times volume equals mass. So then our density is 7860. Our volume is this small number here, 0 0.000549. And so in our calculator, when we plug that in, we take that volume times that density, and we get 4.3 kilograms. That doesn't quite finish the problem, right? We're asked to find its mass and its weight. This is a chance for us to remember that we know what weight is from back in chapter four. Weight is the force of gravity, m times g. So we have 4.3 times 9.8. So 
So we get 42.3 newtons. And that's the weight of that iron ball. So if we had an iron ball of that size, this would be how much mass it has, and this would be its weight in newtons. Okay, so hopefully we didn't struggle too much with those early two problems. The iron ball one is significantly tougher than the, um, than the first example with the mass of air in the room. But in both cases, the format, the structure was the same. And you can always rewind um, if you need to, to make sure that you understand the steps that we took. This one I didn't write out as we went um, off in the way that I do. Okay, the other big idea that we wanna introduce in this video is pressure. Pressure is important because we can't often, we often cannot directly apply a force to a fluid. If I try to poke on the air, the air just kind of goes around my finger and I can't apply a pressure to it. But if I had air in a um, pipe and I had a piston that could push that air through, that piston would be able to apply a force over the surface area of that pipe. So when we think about pressure, that is a way for us to actively push on fluids or for fluids to push on an object. So pressure is force per area. The units of force are newtons and the units of area are meters squared. So the units for pressure, we tend to just write newtons per square meter. That does have a name, pascals, but because we don't use pressure except for this last chapter of our semester, we don't really need to introduce pascals the way that we were using so often these other units. So we can probably just write out newtons per square meter because we also don't wanna get the PA unit confused with pressure as a variable, especially when we're gonna see atmospheric pressure. Okay, now if we think about that idea of pressure, we can have a large pressure because of a large force, or we could have a really large pressure because there's a very, very small area. A small number on the bottom of that fraction means that we have a large pressure. Needles for vaccines are able to pierce the skin not because the doctor is jabbing it into you, but because it's such a small needle point, that small area creates a big enough pressure um, to do what it needs to. So the other thing to note is the way pressure works. Pressure is always exerting forces perpendicular to all of the surfaces. So for the wall behind me, the air is pushing on the wall perpendicular to the wall. For my cheek, the air is pushing perpendicular um, and pushing at my cheek, it's pushing at the top of my head, all of these places, it's perpendicular to all surfaces. Because the air is low density, we don't really feel that force pushing on us. But in water, for example, that pressure has a um, important role to play. We will be talking about the fact that we are able to be held up um, by what's called the buoyant force because of these pressures and the fact that the pressure underneath the swimmer is actually a larger value than the pressure above that swimmer. But that will be um, dealt with in a later video. Now getting back to atmospheric pressure, I mentioned it very briefly a couple of slides ago. There is air all around us. We feel a pressure simply because we aren't at zero pressure, which be, would be a vacuum. It doesn't feel like a high pressure to us, but that's mostly because we have the air pushing at us from all sides. It is actually a quite large number when we start to look at what these pressures can be. Atmospheric pressure is based on looking at all of the air from where we are all the way up to space. It's basically a huge column of air that's pressing down on our heads. It has weight and that force is spread out across an area and it varies from day to day and it varies with altitude, but there is a standard number value for atmospheric pressure that physicists can quote um, and use in calculations. It's given on the slide in terms of newtons per square meter. So it's 101,300 newtons per square meter. There is a reminder on this slide that that is also Pascal's. And then the units that we use in everyday situations um, for pressure in the US 
are PSI, pounds per square inch. So if you have ever used things in PSI, that is pounds per square inch. So pounds per square inch. And atmospheric pressure is about 15. It's 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's the pressure just from the air around us at a standard altitude. Okay. So if we were to picture what that column of air looks like, it isn't actually at a constant density all the way through. The density gets lower and lower until we get to space. But that's because there's less air kind of pushing down on top of it. You can imagine stacking a huge number of pillows, like 30 or 40 pillows, the ones near the bottom of that stack are super, super squashed, and the pillow that you just placed on top isn't squashed down almost at all. So it's worth keeping that in mind. And as a reminder, this pressure is pushing at um, perpendicular to all surfaces. And so it's caused by the air directly above our heads, but it doesn't just point straight down. It points sideways, too, because that's kind of how fluids work. So... Another example for us, the wall that you're in right now, or the room that you're in right now, assuming you're not watching this outside, but there's still probably a building nearby, imagine drawing a um, rectangle that's 20 centimeters by 25 centimeters. We want to calculate the force that is acting on that size rectangle in the room where you are right now. So let's do this one together. If we draw the rectangle, not necessarily directly to scale, we have this length times width, and area is just those two numbers multiplied together. But before we do that, we can note that these units really should be meters. So 25 centimeters is 0 0.25 meters, and 20 centimeters is 0 0.25 two meters. So we get point, the area is 0 0.25 times 0 0.2, and we get 0 0.05, that's square meters, okay? If we think about our brand new equation, pressure, capital P, is equal to force, capital F, over area, capital A, okay? And the pressure, if we are talking about air, we can assume we are talking about atmospheric pressure. So we have this huge number, 101,300, this unknown force, and then our area here. So with our calculators, With our calculators, we get that the force, when we multiply both sides by 0.05, the force is 5,065 newtons. 5,065 newtons. That should seem like a huge force compared to some of the numbers that we were talking about all throughout chapters 4 and 5 and even 6. So if this force is just a small section of the wall that air is pushing on, why isn't that wall falling down? That's a huge force pushing on the wall. Well, the thing is, there's also the wall kind of pushing back on the air, and the air on the other side of this wall, which is my kitchen, um, also is pushing with that same amount. It's kind of a tug of war that no one's winning. And so in order for us to have a net force that can cause any kind of motion, we need a pressure difference. When you hear uh, meteorologists talking about high pressure systems or low pressure systems, they are describing a pressure difference compared to standard atmospheric pressure. That means that there is a net force and there are weather patterns moving um, air around in our atmosphere and causing weather effects because of it. 
So this idea that net force comes from a pressure difference is one that we want to keep in mind as we continue in this, um, in this chapter. So, a question for us. If we have a hot air balloon, how does the pressure inside the hot air balloon compare to the air outside the hot air balloon? So pause the video as long as you need to think, but I really do want you to write down even your one, two, three, four guess for this before we continue. So pause the video if you need to. Okay. So when I ask this question in class, there's never a penalty for being wrong, but when I ask this question in class, about 90% of the group gets it wrong. And normally I give us a chance to talk to each other about this, but we don't have anyone necessarily in our class to easily talk to here, so let's think through it together. If the pressure were higher inside the balloon, then there would be a net force pushing from the inside out, and the balloon would expand until it burst. That would be bad news for the, um, the people in the basket. If the pressure inside the balloon were lower, then the outside air would press into the balloon and it would collapse, it would deflate. That would also be bad news for our hot air balloon um, occupants. And so it actually must be the same pressure. The difference is not the pressure. And that's one thing that a lot of students struggle with because in most cases, students have not used this scientific idea of pressure nearly as often as density, which is the two big new things in this chapter. The reason why the hot air balloon is able to float and carry passengers is because of a density difference, not a pressure difference. So we do have to really make sure we understand that if there is a pressure difference, there is a net force, and we don't want these balloons to burst or deflate. Helium balloons, thinking like uh, zeppelins or blimps, they can also carry a lot of passengers because helium, by its very nature, even cold, has a lower density. But again, this is a situation where the density is different, but the pressure is not. So in the next video, we will be talking about some more applications of these new ideas. This was kind of our introduction to some key terms and ideas with fluids, and I will see you in the next video.